I am pleased today to talk with Kirsten Carlson. I learned about Kirsten from Karen Romano Young. Karen was a featured guest on this podcast, who like Kirsten belongs to the Antarctic Artists and Writers Collective. Kirsten first visited Antarctica as a 24 year old graduate student studying icebergs and how they affect the sea life community living on and in the sea bottom. 25 years later, Kirsten returned to Antarctica as a participant in the National Science Foundation Artists and Writers Program. Kirsten has worked in the icy Antarctic waters making drawings. I'm looking forward to hearing more about her work and her experiences. I encourage everyone listening to the audio only version of this podcast to make time to view the, version, the video version of this podcast. Otherwise, you'll miss something amazing in terms of photographs and videos. Welcome, Kirsten. I am really pleased to welcome you to the Women Mind the Water Artivist podcast. I'm interested to hear how your time at McMurdo Station in Antarctica led you to shift your focus from marine research to science communication. You've written on your Fathom It Studios website that since your first visit to Antarctica, you become an artist, designer, photographer, illustrator, and writer. I'm particularly interested in hearing about drawing underwater. I've welcomed many artists who draw nature, but none have mentioned that they've done so while underwater. Kirsten, I'd like to dive in and ask you how you became interested in marine biology and how you ended up in Antarctica. Okay. Well, first you have to know that I grew up in Missouri and that makes this journey even more interesting in my opinion. So as a child, I fell in love with our local neighborhood swimming pool and became part fish. I swam competitively all through my youth and just loved the water. It wasn't until I was a teenager that I first put my toes in the Pacific Ocean. And meanwhile, concurrently, I was interested in, I, I love animals and I became interested in animal behavior when I was exposed to science starting in like seventh grade. And so it's kind of a full circle that's happened to me. Uh, I do remember when I was a Girl Scout, they came and offered our group a chance to go to Antarctica and I was not interested at all. So the interest in the Antarctica came much later. It came about, <clears throat> excuse me, it came about when I was in graduate school. So my love for the pool, i.e. water, my love for animals and understanding them and just enjoying their company led to my interest in marine science because I kind of combine water and animals. And then when I was in school for university in Missouri, which has no large ocean <laughs> nearby, I became very interested in going to graduate school to continue my education as a marine biologist. So I studied birds as an undergraduate, and then I moved to California to start working on my residency because uh, tuition will, would be a lot cheaper. And I started talking to some of the marine biologists and took a summer course actually at Hopkins Marine Station, which is located right next to Monterey Bay Aquarium. So it was a number of factors there that all came into play. The first day I walked into the aquarium as a 20 year old, I started crying because it was just this amazing place. And the first person I found was the head of the volunteer um, education department and he told me that you could become a volunteer guide which I eventually did and um, when I applied to graduate school at Moss Landing Marine Lab and got in I ended up trying to find work um, because I needed money to put myself through school and the group that had the money was the benthic lab the benthic lab studies invertebrates that live in and on the seafloor you're going to start noticing the connecting dots and the first project i got as a graduate student other than sorting uh, preserved invertebrates through a scope was i was given a data set from the arctic and that data set i did so well organizing that data set and gave it back to the scientists in the group that they were like, do you want to go to Antarctica? And I said, absolutely, I do. So um, just in my second year of school at Moss Landing, I went to Antarctica 
and it changed my life. It was an epiphany and I'd always known that whatever I did with my science career, I wanted to be sort of a person who was an intermediate intermediary between the science and the public that started when I started volunteering at the aquarium. I really enjoyed that aspect of connecting people. And at the same time, I decided science wasn't going to actually fuel my creativity. I was, I, I couldn't find my path as a pure scientist. I knew if, at the time in the nineties that if I wanted to be a scientist, I'd have to do research or education. And I didn't want to be a teacher. And I really didn't like uh, writing research papers. I liked writing creatively. So that's kind of how it all started with I the got, marine science. I got to say you're blowing my mind. First of all, growing up in Missouri and having a Girl Scout troop offer you the chance to go to Antarctica. How cool is that? I mean, when I think of Girl Scouts, I think of Thin Mints. I don't think of trips to Antarctica. And then I have to say, I, I can remember uh, going to Monterey and the aquarium, and I can understand your tears because I was about the same age, and I was hooked too. So when you were asked to go to Antarctica, did you have any idea what you were getting into? My graduate work was with studying beavers in the Sierra Nevada mountains in Northern California. And one of my strongest memories is being cold. The snowmelt water where the beavers live is particularly cold at night, or at least I thought it was. So I was never immersed totally in water, whereas you were underwater. Um, what are your strongest memories of your earliest experiences underwater in Antarctica? So as far as my first memories um, of Antarctica, I had dove in the Arctic. And I had dove, I had been certified in when I was um, 17 at University of Missouri to scuba dive. Uh, up to that point, I had dove in a lake and I had dove in Monterey Bay water, which is about 55 degrees. And then when I went to the Arctic, I was in the Canadian Arctic. And all that diving, you, you can say for sure across the board that all that diving was kind of murky. Um, visibility is limited in in any of those places to 30 feet or on a lucky day maybe 40 but most of the time 10 feet and there were dives where I couldn't even see my hand in front of my face so Antarctica um, aside from preparing to dive in a dry suit which I had done to go to the Arctic the first dive I did underwater uh, it was like I was an astronaut in space because the water was so clear there was no limit to how far I could see except where the light ended so that was one of the f the strongest visual memories I have the other one is a the sense in my hands so as a 24 year old I was given wet gloves which means water could circulate through them we'd pour almost boiling as hot as we could stand water inside our gloves seal them we'd start our dive and within 10 minutes that water would be ambient temperature or probably less i never timed it and then your hands would start going numb instructions were when you could no longer function with your hands you needed to come back up because that was a safety issue so you can still function with numb hands so every time i would come up from the dive my hands would be numb and the sensation of numb hands coming back to life is like pins and needles hitting your funny bone over and over and over on your elbow. It was extremely painful. It happened twice when I was there in 2017 because of some faulty glove stuff, but I was wearing dry gloves then. But um, that, those are my two strongest memories, the clarity of the water and the freezing cold hands. When you're underwater in Antarctica, what do you hear and what do you see? What you hear are your bubbles. And that's true for any scuba diving that you do on regular tanks and regulators. I unfortunately have never had the opportunity to do rebreather diving, which is very quiet comparatively. So the bubbles are a constant, like I call it a watery Darth Vader sound. <laughs> and then 
um, what you see is the first thing that I always notice when I come down through the hole is I'm always looking at the under ice surface because I want to look at the color. It's a beautiful translucent blue. As the season progresses, it becomes more golden uh, and brown because there's plankton diatoms growing on the under ice surface and they are golden brown. So the light is shining 24 seven in Antarctica. And as you enter the underwater world, it becomes sort of a twilight uh, filtered effect because of the light coming through the six or seven feet of ice. And um, then as you descend to the seafloor, often you'll see creatures floating by in the water column, jellies, um, up at this up at this under ice surface you'll usually see very small fish if you keep your eyes open you'll see them moving around and then as you descend to the sea floor the terrain will dictate what you see so if it's a rocky bottom um, you're gonna see things crawling around if it's a soft bottom you can see like clam siphons sticking out of the soft sediments and, and the fish are ever present the sea stars are everywhere and then every once in a while you'll you'll if you're lucky a seal will swim by and you always hear the sound the vocalization of what else seals which is otherworldly and one of the most fascinating sounds i've ever heard okay so you were there to study icebergs on the sea floor how does one go about studying icebergs underwater so in, in 1992, I went to the Arctic and to the Antarctic with the specific project of looking at what icebergs did when they hit the seafloor and how they affected the sea life on the seafloor where these icebergs would plow. So imagine a slow moving tornado or a bulldozer, depending on your visuals. And when it hits bottom, those creatures that can kind of move, like fish, kind of move quickly, they can get out of the way. But there are animals like clams that don't really move a whole lot. So they'll, if they're in the path, they, they can't really leave. So they unfortunately meet their demise. But just like on land, scientists have noticed that there is a recovery that happens after an, an iceberg moves through and scours the bottom a series of communities come back. So obviously the things that move can come in first and they will actually prey on the things that might have died. And eventually as the scour ages and gets older, you can track, the idea was to figure out if you could age and age a scour by the community that was there. So you have an unscoured area and a scoured area. So I read this incredible book by a Canadian cave diver, Jill Heinerth. Um, and her book, Into the Planet, is Jill's experiences diving inside the iceberg caves. It was a dangerous proposition because ice is always moving and changing shape. So when you were studying the, the icebergs, did you ever feel like you were in danger? So I would never do what she did. <laughs> um, I, it's actually, really pretty safe to dive in Antarctica when the sea ice is covering the ocean because that dive hole that's four feet in diameter that you go through combined with the clarity of the water when we're diving there makes it absolutely impossible uh, unless you're blind to lose sight of that hole um, because it glows like a full moon now, when you get up into the shallows of Antarctica and the, the sea ice is really close by, you may lose sight of the hole, but that's why we always have a rope and a flag and these little flashers going off so we can always see it in the distance. Again, the clarity of the water is ideal for that. We could not do that kind of diving um, anywhere else in the world, basically. So how are they keeping the hole open? So in Antarctica, with the dive hole, there's always a hut over the hole. So it's a little heated room. It has a heater. Um, it's a very comfortable place to sit between dives when you're doing your surface interval. And um, they also have rigged a little system so that a fan blows the warm air down on top of the hole 
um, because it, we turn the heat down when we leave and crank it up when we get back in. But that's how the hole stays open. All right. So on your website, you mentioned that you faced many challenges uh, while you were in Antarctica. What were some of these challenges? Well, I'll highlight three for you. Um, and I love to nest them in between the successes as well. So the three challenges that kind of came into play are um, drawing in Antarctica underwater is slightly different than drawing underwater in Fiji, which is the place I started drawing underwater in 2006. And so I ran into some challenges that I could only figure out once I got there um, around coordination with my glove and my pencil. Now, in tropical waters, I typically don't wear gloves, or at least I don't wear a glove on my drawing hand. Sometimes I'll wear a glove on my non-drawing hand, and I'm left-handed. I haven't explained this yet, but I'm wearing a dry suit, so air is the thing that a layer of a thin layer of air is keeping you warm it it moves to the highest point on your body so if you're horizontal and your hands are below your body all the air is not in your hands and that means your hands get cold really fast so about every 30 seconds or so i'd raise my hands when i was drawing so that warm air would come up into my hands and then i'd go back to drawing and i when i first started diving in 2017 to try to figure out how to combine drawing and photography i would go ahead and draw until my hands were cold and then i would switch to the camera because the camera you're like this and your hands are up then we got smarter with the help of the dive officers down there excuse me rob and steve they made my drawing slate which i actually have this is how big it is hopefully you can see that um, they made my drawing slate into a drawing platform. So we attached a light and a camera so that the camera would film what I was drawing as I was drawing it. So I didn't, I no longer had to take the camera separately from my drawing slate. So that was awesome. That was a success. And the light really helped because it's sort of twilight underneath the sea ice. Um, I was finding it a little too dark and I was getting to be near 50 years old. So that was causing some issues. And we had a little, it felt like I had a little traveling desk with me. It was dynamite. So Kirsten, why draw underwater as opposed to taking your pictures and, or photographs and then drawing from them or just sticking with the photographs? Yeah, so it's, um, it's the same reason that I choose to sketch above water, actually. It's to bring me into the present moment. And um, there are things you experience when you're drawing them that don't happen if you're just photographing them. There's things you notice about shapes, about textures, about colors. It slows me down when I'm sketching, whereas with photography, I feel like I'm always hurrying to get the next shot or trying to get the perfect shot and it's, I'm, I'm doing a lot of um, internal like analyzing, whereas with drawing and sketching, whether it be above water, or below water, I'm observing and capturing my creativity and my creative, um, my creative mind has time to sort of think and absorb and ask questions. And it's just, I love field sketching. I've been doing it for so many years now and it's, it really helped me while I was in Antarctica see things and record things and also come away with ideas that I never would have gotten if I had just gone down there with a camera. That's a great analysis and description and I get it. Um, so you showed us what you draw on. What do you draw with? So attached to, I keep it really simple underwater. Um, this is the this is the pencil case uh this i we just moved so the pencil is not in here right now but i use a graphite pencil that's woodless so it has no wood when you use wood underwater it gets waterlogged and it just doesn't do thing doesn't do well so right inside here a um it's a perfect size for a, a pencil that that's called a woodless pencil it's all graphite 
So those are the, and I use plastic paper. I um, used to use write and rain paper when I was in graduate school to record data. This is where it all evolved from is as a marine biologist, I had to record data underwater and I was using a slate, I was using a pencil and I was using underwater paper. And so it was a natural evolution for me to, to as I brought my science and art together, to bring this tool that I use as a scientist into my art world. And the paper that I use now is a modern invention. It's a polypropylene. It's made by a company called Yupo. And um, many artists are using it for above water drawings, but I limit it to a pencil underwater because it's simple. I can, t I can take color notes and um, I'm kind of imitating the explorers of Antarctica from a hundred plus years ago. Nice. So is there a particular message that you're trying to convey when you draw underwater? I'm only interested in chasing and finding and exploring and be, being aware of those things that inspire me because my passion is to inspire um, others about the beauty and wonder of nature. And the only way that I can do that is when I'm inspired by the beauty and wonder of nature. So when I'm inspired, then it will carry through my work. So what sort of challenges are facing Antarctica uh, and specifically the waters around Antarctica? So when I was in Antarctica in 2017, I did talk to um, the people that had been going down for many years about any changes they had seen. And Antarctica underwater is an extremely stable environment. The water temperature doesn't vary a whole lot. And the biggest concern among scientists is that as the temperature changes, so will the pH of the water. And um, that doesn't sound like a very important thing, but when you think about many of the creatures that live underwater, a lot of them use calcium because they have shells. So there is a lot of concern about what will happen to the, the sea life communities as the water warms, which is happening more rapidly on what's called the Palmer Peninsula, um, which extends up below South America, whereas I was diving in McMurdo, which is sort of due south of New Zealand. And I think it's a slightly more stable environment, but as I said, people that have been diving there have noticed changes, specifically the clarity of the water. What can listeners do to make a positive difference from Antarctica waters and the creatures that live in them? help in what ways you think can help the planet. That might be going out and picking up litter. Um, you know, there's a saying that all litter eventually ends up in the ocean, even if you're in Missouri, for example. So doing something as simple as that, even though it's highly unlikely a penguin in Antarctica would ever come across the piece of litter that you picked up on your street, there are effects that you can have like that that really help the planet as a whole. So think globally, think about um, in terms of how you can impact by doing things locally, and it will have a trickle down effect in a place as far away as Antarctica. Okay. Well, thank you, Kirsten, for being on the Women Mind the Water podcast. I hope listeners will agree that this was a fascinating look at the world many of us know little about. I hope they will want to know more. I'm grateful for your sense of adventure and inquisitive nature and for your artistic practice that has immersed us all in a world we might not otherwise have known. I'd like to remind listeners that I've been speaking with Kirsten Carlson for the Women Mind the Water podcast series. The series can be viewed on womenmindthewater.com. An audio-only version of this podcast is available on the Women Mind the Water website, on iTunes, and other sites. Women Mind the Water is grateful to Jane Rice for this use of her song, Women of Water. All rights for the Women Mind the Water name and logo belong to Pam Ferris Olson. This is Pam Ferris Olson.